Okay, so for the final project, the requirement is very flexible. So what we only require to do is to pick a topic and write a survey paper. So if you want to see a, an example, here I'm going to show something, a report we had from previous year's class. So you see that this student picked the topic about exact asymptotic and bootstrap confidence intervals. So it's like a, it's like a survey paper and we will provide an overleaf template for you to write it. So everyone will use the same template and the template will incorporate the margin, the font size, and then you only need to control the number of pages. So this one actually exceeds the number of pages a little bit because we actually, I think in the, in the syllabus, correct me if I'm wrong, requires the length to be six pages. So this one actually went a little bit went a little more than that, but that's okay. So you see how it looks like. So the only requirement is that when you pick the topic, please make sure that it has something to do with what we cover in the class. So they should at least be remotely related, like the asymptotic, right? Large sample theory is the theme of the class. So your topic should also involve asymptotics or large sample. And another thing is that this survey paper, it, when, you wrote, when you write it, you need to use your own language, your own sentences. So copying sentences from an existing paper, that is not acceptable. So when you submit your paper to, you also submit it to CCLE, and we will actually do some check for, um, so for the similarity of the text. With, exist, with existing literature. So please make sure that you write a survey paper from your perspective, use your own language. And in the last week, week 10, we're going to have short presentations from everyone. So based on the current enrollment, I think probably every, everyone will have Mm, we'll have five minutes. That's about that's my estimate. But we'll finalize the presentation schedule in the next two weeks. And also, just for your information, the homework you are you are working on, which is due, which will be due on next Thursday. So that one will be the last homework. So that that means you have more time to focus on the report to the on the final paper. And I think most of the students who are enrolled in this class are PhD students, right? So therefore, I think you can use this as a, an opportunity to for formal writing. And that's very important for PhD study. So yeah, so that's what I want to say. Do you have any questions? Okay, so if there's no question, then we're going to continue our lecture. Okay, so last time we talked about the extreme value order statistic, right? We give some cases about when the IID sample follow from follow a uniform zero to one distribution. What is the asymptotic distribution for the maximum, for the minimum, and for the second maximum? So we'll give you those results. And today we're going to continue our discussion about sample quantiles. So before we can talk about it, so this is an important result from the change of variables in probability density function. This is something we're going to use for today's lecture. And so this change of variable is regarding how the probability density function changes as you transform a variable. So here the setting is we have a random variable x that has density fx. 
And so this is what we call the PDF, probability density function. And we, and let's say that X is in K dimensional. And here we have um, a function G that maps from RK to RK. So its value is in the same dimension as its argument, as its input. And we also require this G to be differentiable. And has an inverse. So we call this invertible. So with this, then let's define y to be gx. This is the transformed vector, random vector. And for the inverse of g, we define the inverse of g to be h. Okay. So this means that you can write y equals gx. You can also write G A A x equals hy. So then the PDF, so the result is the PDF density of y is what? It's actually equal to, we can give it a notation. Let's write it as fy. Okay, and we evaluate at y, then this is equal to the density of x evaluated at hy. But not done yet. We need to have this factor. And the factor is actually what we call the Jacobian. And the Jacobian is what? It's the determinant of the first order derivative of h okay so basically we can write this as the this determinant of h dot y and this and also we need to put an absolute value here so this is what we call the jacobian jacobian of h dot y. So that's it. So you can think about this Jacobian to mean the change of volume as you go from x to y. So here, this Jacobian, if it's equal to one, then you are just going to plug in here in the density function of x, plug in h y to replace x, you're done. But if this transformation is changing the volume in terms of this h dot, so this derivative, then you need to take that into account. So essentially we can actually derive this by the, so we can derive this by the uh, calculus, the, 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 um, the what's, the, what's the name of it? So basically uh, the, the chain rule. Yeah, you can, you, need, you can use the chain rule to actually derive this. So the reason why we can do this is because if you think about a CDF, then the CDF is a probability of an event. And you can have that probability when you talk about Y and you talk about X, but then you take the derivative of the CDF to get a PDF, and then you will actually have a factor out there. Okay, so this is what we call change of variable in probability. And we're going to use that as an important fact from for the following discussion. So the following discussion, we are going to talk about the distribution of, so we are interested in the distribution of U1 to UN, the order statistic from U1 UN IID uniform zero to one. So we're still interested in this setting. And the reason 
why we're interested in this is that if you think about a sample quantile of any distribution, then what is, we can actually think of the sample quantiles corresponding left tail probabilities to be those uniform variables from uniform from zero to one, right? So every left tail probability is between zero and one. We can think of it that way. And so therefore there is some correspondence between the uniform order statistic and sample quantile. And we want to build that connection. So that's why we're still talking about this uniform order statistic. And if you recall, in our last two lectures, we derived the asymptotics for the maximum and the minimum. And those are what we call the extreme order statistic. But now we're going to talk about the general order statistic of uniform zero one. And how can we deal with that? So, you know, the, our most powerful tool is the central limit theorem. And we still want to make use of that. So that's why we, to build that connection, the central limit theorem is about summation of many random, many IIDs, right? How can we build that connection? So here comes the important lemma. And this lemma is very important. That is, it's not asymptotics, it's the exact it's an exact result. So this says that if we have y1, y2, ym plus 1, these are iid exponential 1 random variables. OK, we have iid exponential, and we define the partial sum as i as the summation of yj j from 1 to i so in other words it's just y1 plus plus 2 y i okay a partial summation to the i's random variable and here i of course can go from 1 to m plus 1. so here the important result is about the conditional distribution of Sn, sorry, S1 given S over Sm plus 1 to Sn over Sm plus 1. So the joint distribution of them, those n ratios, conditional on Sm plus 1, okay? is followed in the same distribution as the other statistic u1 to un. So this is the result we are going to show for this lemma. You see, this is very strong because this is an exact result and it connects the partial sum ratio from exponential one distribution to the other statistic from uniform distribution. And then you can see if we can build this connection, then we are close to what we need for central limit theorem because these are the summations. So this is one variable, this is some sum of n variable. So if we don't think about the boundaries, we think about something in the middle, then we can actually use the central limit theorem which we will do after we're proving the lemma. So how can we prove this lemma? We're going to use the density function to show the left-hand side and the right-hand side have exactly the same PDF. To show that the left-hand side and right-hand side have the same PDF. Okay, so how can we show it? So we are going to start for the left hand side, we're going to start with this IID exponential one. Okay, so the density, we first write down the density of y1 to yn plus one. The PDF of y1 
qy n plus one is we write it as fy and so use the y to represent this whole vector and evaluate lowercase y1 to y n plus one. This is easy, right? We're just going to use the fact that iid exponential one. So we can see that it's equal to exponential negative summation yi, i from one to n plus one. And here, don't forget that we have a domain for exponential one. And the domain is that every value has a positive density if and only if they are positive. So here we have this indicator function to indicate that requirement y1 and 2yn plus 1. They are all positive. OK, so our next step is to obtain the joint density for s1 to sn plus 1. So that's, that will get us closer to what we need on the left hand side. So this is what I call this, this for the left hand side. This is what I call the step one. Okay, the first PDF of y one to y n plus one. Then we will get a PDF of s one to s n plus one. So to do this, we need to use that change of variable formula, and we call this f s. We evaluate s one to Sn plus one. So to do that, we need to transform to find a function that maps from Y1 to Yn plus one to S1 to Sn plus one. Okay, so to do that, we need to define, okay, we define, so you see here what we need is H, right? And H actually maps Y to X. Y is our target, X is the density we have. So we also need a function that maps from S to Y. So here we define H, S. So we define, let's see, we need to define this, Y1 to Yn plus one equals a function H of s1 to sn plus one, right? And then you see what's that? How, what, what is the function h? The function h essentially going from partial sum back to the y1 to yn plus one is easy. So h s1 is just y1 and, and y2 is equal to s2 minus s1. S1. And the last one is equal to Sn plus one minus Sn. Okay. So you see that this is our H. Then what is Jacobian? So here we can just get the H dot at Y, at Y1 to, uh, sorry, H dot as S1 to Sn plus one. This will actually be a matrix. And this matrix, if we do it, is equal to, so this first one is that we need to do, so the first row, first row corresponds to the partial derivative of the first element here against each argument. So this one is one, zero, and zero. And the second row corresponds to here, so the derivative for against partial derivative against S1 is negative one, against S2 is one, and the rest is zero. And the last line, last row will be negative one, one. So essentially you see in this matrix H dot, you have, it's a, it's a lower triangle matrix. So all the top triangle is zero, the diagonals are one. And then the line, the, the second diagonal below it is negative one. So that's why you can clearly see that. So the Jacobian of H 
dot s1 to sn plus one. This is just one, right? The determinant of this matrix is just the product, it's the diagonal, that's one. So that makes it easy for us. So coming back here, this is just equal to Fy of Hs, and that's just Y1 to Yn plus one, right? So, and that's what. So essentially, that's what we need here. Um, maybe, yeah, that's what we need here. But when we write it out, we still want to write it in terms of S1 to Sn plus one, not in terms of Y1 to Yn plus one. So what is that? So maybe I can write it further. So probably this is better, Fy s1, s2 minus s1 to sn plus one minus sn. Okay, we're writing this way. And then we have the density here already. In the density, we just have the summation from y1 to yn plus one, and that's sn plus one. So we actually get, this is equal to exponential to negative sn plus one. And here the indicator function is translating to what? Each one, each yi is positive. That will tell me S2 must be strictly greater than S1. S3 must be strictly greater than S2, right? So that's equivalent to here. So the indicator function for the domain becomes like zero less than S1, less than S2 less than Sn plus one. Okay, so now we get a PDF of this. And one step closer, we are now going to go from this S1 to Sn plus one to the ratio S1 over Sn plus one to Sn over Sn plus one. So we are going to call this step three so in step three, we are going to define zi as the ratio si over sn plus one. And here I go from one to n. Okay, now we are going to go from z1 to zn. So we have a vector z1 to zn and sn plus one. So we're going to go from this vector back to s1 to sn plus one. Just like in step two, we go from, you see the h function maps s1 to sn plus one to y1 to yn plus one. Okay, so we let this s1 to Sn plus one be a function of Z1 to Zn in Sn plus one. So still from N plus one dimensional to N plus one dimensional. And how do we go from Z1 to Zn, Sn plus one to S1 to Sn plus one? That's easy, right? So we see that multiplying Zi to Sn plus one will give us Si. So this is actually Z1 Sn plus one to Zn Sn plus one. And the last one is Sn plus one. Okay. And then what is the G dot? Evaluate this at Z1 to Zn Sn plus one. It is still a matrix and we can see that when we take the partial derivative, so the first row corresponds to the partial derivatives of this. So against Z1, we get Sn plus one. And the middle ones are zero. The last entry is against Sn plus one. So we have Z1. Okay, 
And in the nth row, we would actually have Sn plus one. And here we have Zn. Last one is we only have one. So that will be the derivative of the G dot. So then what's its Jacobian? You see that we are still having, uh, this, this becomes an upper triangle matrix and its determinant is still the product of the diagonal entries. So here the determinant of G dot Z1 to Zn as n plus one. This is actually equal to as n plus one to the power n, okay? And because we know those as n plus ones are positive, so the absolute value doesn't is not is not needed. So that's what we have. So then we use the change of variable to get the density of Z1 to Zn and Sn plus one. So the PDF of Z1 to Zn, Sn plus one is, we write it as Fz, Sn plus one. And we evaluate as Z1 to Zn, as n plus one, okay? And this is equal to, if we apply the transformation and use the density of S1 to Sn plus one, Fs evaluated at what? At Z1 Sn plus one, Zn Sn plus one and Sn plus one and then times the Jacobian. And here the Jacobian is Sn plus one to the power m. Okay, so now let's revisit what this density is. So it's actually here, it's this one. So if you look at it, then you can see that it's still the same term as n plus one. So putting it back, we would have exponential to the negative as n plus one, okay? And times this Jacobian as n plus one to power n. How about the indicator function? So previously it's about zero less than s1, less than s2, less than s n plus one. Now we're changing this to z, right? zi for, we're changing s1 to s n to z1 to z n. So writing it out in terms of Z, we can actually write it as so the order still, the strict increasing order is kept. So we have zero less than Z1, less than Zn, less than one. Those is what we require. And the last one, Sn plus one still needs to be positive. So we have this density. So finally, you see what we have on the left-hand side is the conditional density. So this is the conditional density. To obtain the conditional density, we need the joint density divided by this density of Sn plus one. So we are very close to there. So you see that to get a conditional density is essentially the conditional density of Z1 to Zn given Sn plus one. So we need to derive the marginal density of Sn plus one before we do the division. Okay, so what is the marginal density of Sn plus one? That is something we know. Here, Sn plus one equals Y1 plus plus two Yn plus one. So it's a sum of N plus one IID exponential one random variable. So since the y1 to yn plus one. They are all iid exponential one. Okay, so then we have sn plus one, a result we already used last time is a gamma distribution with the parameters n plus one and one. 
the shape and the ray parameters. So here n plus one represents the numbers, the number of yi's in the summation. So therefore we know its density. So the PDF of Sn plus one is, we write Fsn plus one, evaluate this at lowercase Sn plus one. So this is from gamma density. We just use that formula. One over n factorial as n plus one to the power n times exponential to negative as n plus one. That's the gamma n plus one one density. We still need an indicator to indicate a condition for the domain of gamma that's positive. As n plus one must be greater than zero. Okay. So finally, last step. So I call this four, okay? So finally five is that the conditional PDF of Z1 to Zn conditional on Sn plus one is, we just did a division. So I call this Fz given Sn plus one. Okay, and this density is only about n random variables. Uh, we evaluate it as z1 to zn. Okay, and it's simply the division of those two things. That is fz sn plus one, z1 to zn sn plus one divided by F S N plus one at S N plus one. Okay. And you see if I divide this by this, I will have this term canceled, this term canceled, and I'm left with an N factorial. Okay. And I still need the, I still need this condition on Z1 to Zn. So it's indicator that zero less than Z1, less than, less than Zn, less than one. Okay, so you see after so many, so many calculations, we have obtained this conditional distribution, conditional density. Now let's check the right-hand side. The right-hand side is about the density of uniform order statistic of the uniform distribution. Okay, right hand side. Hmm. The PDF of U1 to UN. Okay, so what is that? How can we calculate this? So if you think about, if we drop the order statistic, just have IID and IID random variables from uniform zero to one. So where U1 to UN are IID from uniform zero to one. Okay, so what would be the density of U1 to UN? That's actually very, so the PDF of this is what? It's actually equal to every density is one. We multiply them together. So the product of n ones is still one, right? And we only have a requirement for the domain. So we have it's equal to the indicator that for each ui, we have it between zero one. So u1 to un between zero to one. How about here? So the PDF of the ordered things. So then you can see that we can have how many cases of u1 to un that have the same, that give us the same order statistic. You know, what's, what's lost here is the order, right? Here we is unordered and here we have the order. So the same set of 
order statistic would correspond to possible values that are the same subject to permutation. So if you have the same n numbers, but if you shuffle them, then they are a different set of u1 to un, but they are the same set of order statistic. So here, the order statistic value will correspond to n factorial possible values of u1 to un. So we have the n factorial for the possible permutation. And here, the domain is now becoming indicator that zero is less than u ordered one, less than, less than u ordered n, less than one. Right, so here we have to enforce the order and the n factorial because we have n factorial possible, possible u1 to un that gave us the same order statistic. So if you compare this density to this density, we can exactly say, see that they are the, we, we can immediately see that they are the same density. So we prove it. So basically we show that the density of the left-hand side is the same as the density of the right-hand side. So we show that Z1 to Zn given as n plus one has the same distribution as the order statistic from uniform zero to one. And this is so important for us because with this lemma, so with this lemma, so given the lemma, if we want to study the joint distribution of two order statistic, any two order statistic, let's call it ui, uj. <clears throat> Okay, and let's say that here we have i and j being two integers and they are both between say one and n. Okay, we just need to study the joint distribution of si over sn plus one and fj over sn plus one. And you see SI, SJ, SN plus one are three sums of IID exponential one. That will make the central limit theorem applies. So you see SI, SJ is equal to YJ, J from one to I, right? So that's a sum, so is SJ. So here the J, maybe I can change to K, YK and sj k from one to j yk, sn plus one k from one to n plus one yk. So these are three sums. As long as i and j are large, uh, n plus one is large for sure, then we can apply central limit theorem to each of them. Okay, so by C CLT, central limit theorem. Let's use SI as an example. What it is about, it's actually saying that the root I times the average, right? Average is equal to sum divided by the number of items. SI divided by I. That's the average minus the expectation of each YK. And each YK is what? is one, is exponential one, right? So minus one. This is converging in law to normal distribution, zero mean. And what's the standard deviation? So what's the variance of yk? That's still one. So we have that. And this is as i goes to infinity. And this is because the expectation of y1 is equal to one expected. So the variance of y1 is equal to one. So the central limit theorem becomes that. Okay, so then let's look further. So what if, if we have this i over n approaching a constant p? So if, think about it. So we have 
Um, n goes to infinity and i goes with n, but their ratio goes to a constant p. This is something very interesting. The reason why this is interesting is that if you think about it, we have s, i, and so it's a partial sum. So it basically means that compared to the total sum as n plus one, then what we have here is that, so the portion occupied by SI, but by this partial sum of the first I element is about P, is about proportion P. So zero less than P less than one. So therefore we can still talk about the distribution of SI, but now we're going to talk about it in terms of N plus one as opposed to I. So what I mean exactly is this. So if you think about with this relationship, then I could write M plus one root M plus one of S I divided by M plus one, not I minus I divided by M plus one. So think about this term. And I can write it in terms of this one. So you see, you see that this is equal to root i m plus one times root i, okay, times s i my over i minus one. So you see, basically, this is what I have from here. And if I multiply this by this constant, I can obtain this left hand side, right? You can just do a simple algebra and you will be able to see it. Um, yes, you'll be able to see it. And then what is this one converging to? You see, this is converging to in law. So the constant is converging to root P, okay? And this second part is converging to standard normal. And this distribution is just normal zero mean variance P. So I basically derived the distribution for this left hand side using root M plus one as the constant because here we are total number of items in the IID exponential one is M plus one. And then, so you see that another thing I can similarly derive, which I'm going to skip, but leave this for you to check the notes. It's posted to CCLE. Is that similarly, we can have what's left is just algebra. Similarly, we have root m plus one times sj minus si over m, my, m plus one minus j minus i over m plus one. This is converging in law to normal zero mean and the variance is, okay, I should give another thing. It's actually converging variance is q minus p, okay? So here, let's say that j over n is converging to q. And here, because if I call j greater than i, okay, j greater than i, then I would have q greater than p, but still less than one. So this is another proportion between zero and one. And so the difference between the two partial sum, if I divide this by n plus one and do this change it's converging to normal distribution as well. But the variance is just the difference between the two proportions. So this is a very interesting result, right? So we connect the partial sum and its asymptotic distribution is, we connect the partial sums asymptotic distribution with the proportion of this partial sum among the, among the to, uh, with the proportion of the partial sum among the total. So here I less, sorry, I should say the partial, this is the, this is amount 
uh, among the total sum, what proportion is explained by the, the sum of the first i elements. So that's the p and that's the q. And so you're, you can see that we're getting closer and closer to the sample quantile because the sample quantile is just about what value give us the left tail probability of p and q. And our last bit of result is, so similarly, I have this. And the last bit of result is about still n plus one. But now I'm going to get the last sum, the total into here as n plus one minus sj over n plus one minus here I would have n plus one minus j over n plus one. This is converging in law to normal distribution, mean zero, the variance is one minus q. Okay, so we have basically derived what we called another lemma, which is just about these. So we have derived those individually, but that lemma is just a joint distribution of those three things together. So let's get another piece of paper and call that a lemma. So let's restate the conditions. So we have y1 to yn plus one as iid exponential one. Okay, and we have these conditions. So basically we have root n times i over n minus p. This is conversion to zero. And this is about constant, so there's no random variable here. It's just a numbers converging to zero. And the notes was, pr the previous note posted had a typo there and I corrected. And we also have root n j over n minus p. This converge to zero. So you see that we actually give this a rate. It's actually converging to zero faster than the increase in root n. So we need that for this lemma. And previously we just say, okay, I by over n minus p go to zero. But in that not so rigorous statement, here we make it more rigorous by having this rate root n here. And then the statement is about the joint distribution of three things. So it's the joint distribution of three things. The first one is S i over m plus one. The second thing is S j minus S i over m plus one. The last one is S n plus one minus S j over m plus one. Okay, three things minus P, Q minus P, one minus Q. Okay, and these are converging in law jointly to a three dimensional unif uh, normal distribution zero mean. And the covariance matrix is just P, Q minus P, one minus Q and the off diagonals are zero. Okay, so um, this is the lemma. And with this lemma, then we will have our result for the uniform order statistic distribution. And that's what we call the theorem. So the theorem here is about two order statistic, okay? So this is about U1 to UN R order statistic, or an order statistic of a uniform zero, one, IID, sample u1 to um okay so 
still we need those two conditions. So if root n i over m minus p is convergent to zero and root m j over m minus q is convergent to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, and we have zero less than p less than q less than one. Then we have the joint distribution of ui and uj as this. So then root m times ui uj minus correspondingly p and q is converging in law to normal distribution zero mean this is a two-dimensional normal distribution and the covariance matrix is p times one minus p q times one minus q and this is p times one minus q and p times one minus q okay this is the distribution for the uniform order statistic. And you can see why, now coming back to our previous lecture, you can see why we need a special derivation for the extreme order statistic, the minimum and the maximum. The reason is that if you think of i equals one, right? When i equals one, this p is what? Zero. And when i equals n, the p when j, let's say, when i equals one, p is zero. When j equals n, q is one. And whenever p is zero or one, or q is zero or one, we will have an asymptotic variance that's equal to zero. So we are in the degenerate case. So that's why in the previous extreme order statistic, we need those special derivation. And you see the rate here is n instead of root n, because on that case, root n is not enough to guarantee a non-degenerate distribution. But this result shows that if the P and Q are between zero and one, which means that the UI and UJ are not on the boundaries, but in the middle, then we can have the asymptotic normality. Okay, so the asymptotic normality holds with condition. It's not unconditional. So with this, now we are getting, okay, so to prove this, right, we still just need that mm, change of variable formula. So that's the same, that's the same thing we need. So let's do it. So let's do this quickly. So for to prove here, what we need is how do we go from these things in the lemma to the other statistic? Okay, so here we, oh, sorry, I, 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 I cut it wrong. We are not going to need a change of formula because we are now in the asymptotic case. We're going to apply the Kramer's theorem to do variable transformation to go from these to this. So we're going to apply Kramer's theorem. So you see the difference. Kramer's theorem is about asymptotic normal distribution. That's where Kramer's theorem applies. And the change of variable density formula, that's an exact result. It's not about asymptotic distribution, it's about the exact distribution. And also for the continu continuous mapping theorem, the first statement of Slutsky, that one is, is also about asymptotics, but it's about applying the same transformation to both, the, both side, right? So if you have a standard normal, you squared it, it becomes chi-square one. So you're transforming both sides. But here, Kramer theorem means that you keep normal as normal, but you just change the variance. So compared to the continuous mapping theorem, this is a further approximation by using first order Taylor expansion so that the transformation is taken as linear. So that's why the linear term goes into the variance, asymptotic variance. So those are the differences. Okay, so now let's see how we can go from, here we need to go from these three things SI, SJ minus SI, SM plus one minus SJ 
to those other statistics, right? And we already have that connection from the pre the first lemma. The first lemma gave us the result, very important result. That is, we can take the condition, the ratio, right? The ratio of SI over SM plus one. That has the same distribution as UI, the other statistic. SJ over SM plus one. And condition on SM plus one. That has the same distribution as UJ. So we're going to use that. Okay, so what we need is to go from, to obtain the distribution of S. So we need to go from SI M plus one, SJ minus SI M plus one, <clears throat> SM plus one minus SJ M plus one. We need to go from those three things to SI over SM plus one, SJ over SM plus one. That's what we need. Okay, and what, what function can do the job? So then we can define function G of three arguments, X, Y, Z. We define it as the first one is X over X plus Y plus Z. The second one is x plus y over x plus y plus z. So you can see that by this, by this definition, then we would have g s i n plus one, s j minus s i n plus one, s n plus one minus s j n plus one. You will have this just equal to SI over SM plus one and SJ over SM plus one, right? So if you define G in this way, then you can map from here to here. So, and because we know the distribution of this is the same as the distribution of U and UJ. So when condition on SM plus one. So then we can just apply the Kramer's theorem. So this, Okay, so conditioning on, let me put it here, conditioning on SN plus one. So then you can apply Kramer's theorem to this. So what we mean is that, so root N plus one, okay. We have SI over SN plus one sj over sn plus one minus g of the three things p q minus p one minus q this is converging in law to normal distribution zero mean and we would apply Kramer's theorem so we would have Mm, G dot of P, Q minus P, Y minus Q times the matrix. So the matrix is from this lemma, this matrix. So P, Q minus P, one, um, sorry, one minus Q. And last one is the G transpose, okay? G dot P, Q minus P, one minus Q. This thing transpose. That's the result. And we can simply do the algebra. So I'm, I'm going to skip the thing, but just to let you know that here the G dot. So, so basically we can use the G function to obtain the derivative. 
But anyway, so this one, the first one here, if you do the simple calculation, x over x plus y plus z, right? So that will give us what? One. So p over one. So this is just equal to p and q. This is easy to calculate. And this g dot, this one, is actually equal to one minus p, negative p, negative p. One minus q, one minus q, negative q. And you're going to have its transpose here. Then you do some algebra. So ultimately you can see that we will be able to calculate the product of this equal to P one minus P one minus P Q one minus Q P one minus Q P one minus Q. Okay. That's the statement in the theorem. And as you can see that, so when we talk about the asymptotic distribution of this, it has nothing to do with Sn plus one. So Sn plus one basically goes away. So that's why if we condition it on Sn plus one, it's still the same distribution. And that gives us a distribution, asymptotic distribution of Ui and Uj. So that's how we get a theorem. So this is the most important result we're going to use for deriving the sample quantile. The sample quantile will be based on the, the order statistic of uniform zero to one. Okay, so that's our final theorem before we get to our final result. So now let's talk about sample quantile. And what is sample quantile? So we actually define it still based on order statistic. So we define x1 to xn as iid from some distribution f, where f is the CDF and we write its PDF as lowercase f. Okay, so we sort them as order statistic. So after sorting, we write them as x, x1 to xn. Then what is the pth sample quantile? The pth sample quantile is defined as x the ordered of n times p, but we take the seeding because it may not be an integer. That's the definition of the sample compound. It is based on order statistic. So you multiply the p, the prob left tail probability by n, and then you take the ceiling and the corresponding order statistic is called the sample quantile. So the corollary about sample quantile distribution, um, asymptotic distribution of sample quantile is as follows. So for example, if you let P equals 2.5, okay, then this is the median. X 0.5 N ceiling is what we call the sample median. The corollary says that we would have, if we have the zero less than P, less than Q, less than one. Okay. And we also have density function. Mm, so we have density function F to be continuous and positive. So it cannot be zero in neighborhoods of, let's use this, 
xp and xq. So where the xp and xq are the population quantiles of f. Population quantiles of the distribution. If you recall, in our first lecture, we gave a formal definition of the population quantile of a distribution. And here it's easier because we are having a density, right? Means that at least around these two things, it is a continuous density, it's a continuous distribution. So which means that there's no point mass at those two compounds. So we don't need to worry about this continuity of the distribution at those two compounds. So then the asymptotic distribution about sample compounds tells us root n times the pth sample quantile and the qth sample quantile minus their population counterparts xp and xq is converging in law to two dimensional normal distribution zero mean. And the covariance matrix needs some modification from the uniform zero to one. So it's actually P times one minus P over F X P square. The density evaluated at the pth population quantile and squared. P times one minus Q over fxp fxq p times one minus q fxp fxq lastly q times one minus q fxq squared this is the final result we need for sample quanta okay and the reason we can derive this is again, we can always transform the sample quantile into the sample quantile of uniform zero to one. And in uniform zero to one, the sample, the quantile, the in sample in uniform zero to one, the sample quantile is exactly the order statistic corresponding to that P. So, so basically, because the uniform statistic, uniform random variables are uniformly between zero and one by definition. So you know that by picking the pth sample quantile of u1 to un, it's just equal to that value. So the value of the order statistic of MP ceiling, that will be the uniform quantile. So we know that immediately. So what I want to say is that we can apply the uniform result over here to this general distribution F by applying, by doing transformation, by transforming these random variables into uniform and then apply the uniform result. So before we finish, we are going to prove this. So what we mean is that we are going to apply. So we, we want to do the transformation, okay? The transformation is that U order statistic MP minus P. So in the uniform case, the population, the pth population quantile is exactly P. That makes things a lot easier. And we also need to transform U and Q minus the population quantile, which is Q under uniform distribution to what we need, X minus XP. Minus XQ. This is what we need. We need the transformation. And what is that? So 
This is something we need to apply Cramer's theorem so we can go from here to here. And what we, how can we do the transformation? We talked about that before. We just apply the inverse of the CDF of x1 to xn and we're done. So we just need a g function define g x y equals to f inverse x f inverse y. Okay, so with this, then we would have g of these things, np minus p, nq minus q. This will follow the same distribution as x np Okay, then you can see Cramer's theorem can be applied. So we would just apply Cramer's theorem to this result, to the theorem result, so that we can obtain the corollary asymptotics for any sample quantile. Okay, so to do that, we just need the G dot, right? So the G dot at X, Y is what? It's a two by two matrix. And here it's F inverse X. We're going to take its partial derivative against X and Y. So this can actually, we know this is a calculus result. This is actually equal to one over the density F inverse X, one over the density F inverse Y. And the other two entries are zero. So you see, we have that, and we are going to do the multiplication to use the Cramer theorem. So this will be multiplied to this and also right multiplied. So we'll have that, those two things, and that will actually give us this. Because if we take the F inverse, if we take the AF inverse at XP, sorry, we can we'll take the F inverse at P, it's equal to XP. Okay, so applying Cramer's theorem, gives the result, result, because we would have G dot, here the X and Y is PQ, is equal to one over FXP, one over FXQ. Okay, so with this result, with this corollary, then our problems about sample compounds in the homework will become solvable. So whenever you use it, for example, if you want to derive it for a median, then P is set to one half, then you will have one half, one half, and you need the population quantile to be plugged in and the density. Those will give you the asymptotic distribution you need. And so to fully understand this result, I think we need to thoroughly understand the definition of the sample quantile, the population quantile, and what's the left tail probability and the connection between a uniform random variable to variable of any distribution. So those are the important things we need so that we can fully understand this. So we will stop here. And next time when we come back, we are going to give you some examples about the about, how, about application of this corollary. And so I'm going to post the notes about the examples to CCLE so you can check them out before our next lecture. Okay, so that's all for today. And we're going to see you again on next Tuesday.